Hello everyone, I'd like to welcome you all to our 808 workshop here at Kiwi Tech with a special focus on AI, ML, blockchain, and augmented and virtual reality. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Donna Lazarescu and I work in the New York office. Um, I'm happy to be here today and I'd like to start by thanking you all for joining us. A warm welcome to our wonderful presenters who have taken time to be here and impart the knowledge with us. Today's mentors are Jeff Goldsmith, Chooch AI, Mark Germishus, NGA, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, Sarab Bardwaj, our very own enterprise architect here at Kiwi Tech, and Hans Koch with MyXR. Thank you all for being here. Now, before I turn things over to our EVP, Mohsen Syed, I'd like to go over some housekeeping rules. Presentations will be 15 minutes each, Presenters will be setting their own internal clocks to track timing and following those 15 minute presentations, there will be a 15, excuse me, five minute Q&A for each presenter. There is a response time of one minute for each selected question and for attending startups and founders, please submit your questions via the Q&A feature in the Zoom. Uh, during the event, there will be feedback surveys as well. Please answer them as openly and honestly as you are able to, as your feedback is valuable to us. And you'll also have the ability to sign up for one-on-one -on -one consulting sessions with these mentors. And additionally, for startups that would like to know more about our ecosystem, there's an option to select in that feedback form and we'll connect you to a representative in your area. Uh, and now, to our Chief uh, Startup Officer, Mohsen Syed, thank you so much for um, you know, building this program from the ground up. He'll tell you a little bit about our ecosystem here at Kiwi Tech. Awesome. So uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening, because uh, we've got uh, guests from all across the world dialing in. My name is Mohsen Syed. Uh, I'm the EVP and the Chief Startup Officer at Kiwi Tech on behalf of Kiwi Tech, on behalf of today's mentors. Uh, a warm welcome to all our guests who are joining in uh, from all parts of the world. Uh, a very warm welcome and a big thank you to uh, all the mentors today who have taken their time to share some of their valuable learnings with us, with our startup uh, founders. Um, and I, I would not take too much of time going over Kiwi Tech because a lot of guests today uh, are either our portfolio companies or know a little about Kiwi Tech, but there are always new guests who join us. So for the benefit of those, I'll quickly run through what Kiwi Tech is and what we do to, in the context of the startup community. Uh, but before we get to that, um, I just want to uh, wish everyone uh, a really safe and healthy uh, time with your families. Um, I know that there are a few regions uh, where the lockdowns have been lifted, uh, but I would still uh, continue to pray for everyone's safety, for your family's safety, uh, because at the end of the day, that is very, very important for all of us today as a community, uh, and especially as innovators uh, who are uh, striving to make an impact, to striving to make a difference. Uh, I think today health uh, as the core of what we do uh, has taken much more significance than anything else. So with that said, um, I'll have a, a quick couple of slides to talk about uh, you know, the Kiwi Tech model. About Kiwi Tech, who we are, um, we today have grown to be a global community of innovators, mentors, investors, uh, and corporations. Um, now in the center of uh, our program, our ecosystem, are those 250 plus portfolio companies. Uh, predominantly, most of these startups are uh, from US. We have a dozen from Canada. Uh, we have a couple from Qatar. Uh, and we are slowly seeing uh, some opportunities that we are working on in UK, Switzerland, and France. Uh, but but what, what is the entire excitement about our ecosystem are our portfolio companies uh, who again are to different stages in their business. You know, some of them uh, are just about to launch their first minimum viable product. Uh, and some of them are uh, clocked in close to $40 million in annual recurring revenue last year. So we have an entire gamut uh, of business stages that our portfolio companies uh, belong to. Uh, they represent um, all the top industry verticals that you can think of. Um, and what, what brings us much more closer to our portfolio companies today, apart from uh, the technology services that we provide, are our investor network. Um, we have a very committed, engaged group of investors 
Uh, again, predominantly most of them are from the US uh, who have invested in our portfolio companies uh, throughout their journey. Um, and uh, they've invested close to $75 million over the last eight years that the program has been running. Uh, and most of these investors also turn out to be our mentors uh, because these are mostly predominantly tech investors who have had backgrounds uh, in, in tech startups and unicorns and large businesses uh, that have invested in tech. Uh, so a lot of our mentors today are from the investor network and some of them are uh, a part of the partnership group of mentors that we're building uh, actively today. And today you have three of them joining us uh, to talk about some of uh, how they could help or how as mentors or as businesses, they could help some of our portfolio companies and other startups. Um, just to talk about the journey so far, uh, we started the program uh, in 2013 uh, after the founders of Kiwi Tech had their exit back in 2012 uh, for, you know, for, for a pretty good nine digit figure. Um, and then we wanted to be uh, an integrated ecosystem play wherein we're not just providing technology services to startups partially in exchange for an equity position, so there is an alignment of interest and there's an incentive to build great product, great technology, but we also use the alignment of interest to look at other business functions where we could help them. Uh, the immediate business function or the immediate requirement for a lot of startups along with technology is capital. So we launched our Kiwi Tech demo days uh, in 2017, which uh, again was an intimate setting, mostly held in, uh, in a, in a personal environment uh, before uh, you know, the COVID-19 uh, you know, came into existence. Uh, so we would have a batch of six to eight startups present to a group of uh, about 20 to 40 investors in different cities across the world. Uh, today, all of that has gone virtual uh, and uh, we still continue to have these events almost every week. Uh, these events are usually uh, team-based today. Uh, they are either a particular industry vertical focused or they are a particular regional focus. Um, and uh, today, a lot of the capital that flows into our portfolio companies are through uh, investors that uh, listen to these pitches of our startups at these demo days. Uh, 2019 uh, saw another uh, landmark event that got launched, which uh, we, which the reason why we are today, uh, the 808 series, the Entrepreneur Workshop. And I'll talk a little bit about it in the next slide. Um, in 2020, uh, we are close to uh, about almost 300 startups. You know, it's tough to keep up some, some figures in our timeline, but we're getting closer to that number of 300. And we, uh, we sincerely believe that uh, by 2020, 2023, we could be uh, one of the largest and one of its kind ecosystem of 100,000 plus portfolio companies uh, working together. Um, and this just gives a little bit of the deal flow uh, that we see at Kiwi Tech. Uh, we've been very, very fortunate uh, that we have uh, a very professional uh, and a startup focused team uh, that can uh, have uh, several layers of due diligence throughout its process. Um, and this is another reason why there's a strong stickiness with a lot of our investors is because we do a lot of their due diligence uh, on their behalf. Um, so just over the last two years, uh, we have reviewed close to 65,000 startups uh, We've had spoken to and have met close to 10,000 entrepreneurs to arrive at a final portfolio of 165 companies in the last two years. Uh, we look at hitting similar numbers, or if not, north of about 150 startups this year. Um, so we get to see um, a lot of uh, Trojan horses, I would say. Uh, at the end of the day, our philosophy is betting on the jockeys because we believe that it's you as an entrepreneur, uh, that will take it to the finish line is you as an entrepreneurial team will take it to the finish line. Um, and the final companies or the portfolio companies that we partner are truly because of the entrepreneurs uh, who are leading them. Uh, the pillars of the ecosystem, I alluded to a few things uh, uh, in my initial slides. Technology, uh, we have a technology team of 500 plus, both based in India as well as stateside. Uh, and we provide, uh, you know, the entire uh, you know, A to Z of product development under one roof through full-time employees uh, of Kiwi Tech. Uh, and it's not just building a product because we have an equity position through the services that we provide. We are extremely committed to the success of the products and to the long-term scalability and the sustainability of the technology 
that we're building for our portfolio companies. Uh, capital raise, because we have a vested interest in the success of the business, uh, it's another organic element of our ecosystem to help startups raise capital. Uh, and as we have ventured into uh, other support functions, mentoring and go-to-market support are one of the more key elements of our ecosystem today. The Startup 808 series, uh, you know, typically when we do these uh, workshops, uh, that's the opening quiz um, that, uh, you know, usually, uh, the, uh, you know, the person who guesses the answer gets a cool wine bottle. Uh, but today we know we should potentially look at how we can give away some raffles virtually, maybe Amazon gift cards. Uh, but the 808, uh, you know, without kind of making it too much of a suspense, is because 404, uh, as that unknown error for an entrepreneur, is the most dreadful thing to see, uh, you know, uh, when they're building their product or with, their, with any of their digital assets. Uh, and at Kiwi Tech, that's one of the most common um, problems that entrepreneurs come to us to fixing it. Um, so as we've seen a lot of 404s, we just don't want the same mistakes to happen again. So the 808 is, is just a, a representation of 404 not repeating it. Um, so the whole workshop was designed to impart the learnings that we at Kiwi Tech and our partners have in building more than 2,000 products for our portfolio companies. Uh, and we wanted that learning to go out in an educational format to our portfolio companies and other startups. Um, as you know, in, in, from our previous slides, we have reviewed and analyzed more than 150,000 startups through the course of our startup program with a million plus brainstorming sessions with different really, really fantastic entrepreneurial teams. A lot of that has helped us with tremendous amount of learning that today we feel we are in a uniquely privileged position to take that learning back to the community. Uh, so usually our workshop topics are around um, uh, these four quadrants, which we believe are quintessential for the success of a startup, whether it's product design, strategy, and technology. Um, and today we have a fantastic team of mentors uh, because as, as, as everybody is trying to leverage the new opportunities that COVID-19 presents, a lot of them are looking at some of the more, what they call it, the deep tech topics uh, like AI, machine learning, blockchain, AR and VR. Uh, and a lot of the startups do believe that uh, these technologies uh, do provide some form of a cutting edge. So we, we brought in the best in class uh, in terms of mentors around these topics today for you. Uh, I sincerely hope uh, that uh, you take a lot of learning from these sessions. Uh, these mentors will be available for uh, consulting sessions over the next few days and weeks. Um, so if uh, you're interested, feel free to reach out to events at kibitech.com. You would also get reminders throughout the event, uh, you know, uh, the feedback forms uh, by which you could register for these consulting sessions. Uh, but without you know, further delaying uh, the sessions, let me pass it on to Donna and the wonderful uh, group of mentors that we have today. I'm excited today uh, to go through these sessions myself um, as a student uh, because some of these topics are absolutely fantastic you know, to understand in the context of where we are today as a technology community. Thank you everyone again. Uh, I really do appreciate uh, your time today. Um, with us and over to Donna uh, and uh, the rest of the mentors. Thanks everyone. Fantastic. Thank you so much Mohsen for that wonderful introduction to Kiwi Tech. Um, let's go ahead and kick it off with our first tech mentor. Um, the topic is now is the time to leverage visual AI by Jeff Goldsmith with Chooch AI. Jeff, if you can please share your video and your screen. How's that? Is that okay. good? Okay, great. Yeah. So let me uh, share my video and, and please let me know that it's showing okay. Good morning, everyone. I can hear you say good morning back. Um, so AI is, um, uh, the adoption of AI is actually acceler accelerating right now. Visual AI is um, uh, a game changer in uh, several different ways. Um, um, it's helping to, um, ensure um, compliance with um, uh, wearing of masks, for example. That's a big need 
because of COVID-19. And um, um, there are other processes that can be accelerated, as I'm sure you're thinking about. Uh, any visual process can be accelerated with visual AI. Um, that's why there's an expected uh, growth uh, with these technologies um, that's coming right up. Um, and this is just my presentation is just specific to visual AI because that's what I know and that's what I do. But general AI can be, you know, a lot of these ideas can be adapted to that, uh, to um, things like natural language processing or um, uh, text recognition, that sort of thing. Um, the first thing you need to do before you do any of this is define a problem that you need to solve and obviously assign a budget to that because it does take time to get these things done. Um, what kind of problems can you solve? We'll get into that in a moment, but once you d define that, then you need to design how your process is going to work. How are you going to uh, deploy this? How are you going to train the system? And you begin this with data collection. What kind of data do you need to, um, to do this? With visual AI, you need imagery, right? You need imagery of people wearing masks and people wearing not masks, for example. That's, I'll use that as an example throughout this presentation because it's something that we're all thinking about. Um, and it, it's quite a simple thing. And you just need to show that image from a number of different angles different kind of faces, different kind of masks. And then you can train the system to, um, to recognize that, those, those images. And you do that by annotating and labeling that this face has a mask. I, I'm not wearing a mask, obviously. So my face would be labeled uh, no mask, right? And if I were wearing a mask, you would label the face you know, wearing mask. And then once you um, have that, you have a model that um, does, for example, object recognition. You, you are recognizing this mask. You also have models su such as facial recognition. And um, it, it's important to separate those models out for privacy, for example, with uh, you know, mask compliance. Oftentimes is a privacy concern. So you, can, you could add facial recognition to that, to that um, set of models in, in the AI you're deploying, but then you would know who's wearing masks and who's not. So it's important to think about these, these sort of ethical concerns when you're doing this sort of thing as well. Um, once you've, you've trained your model, then you test it, right, in the field. You load it onto a device and you, you parse your video stream and you see what kind of results you get, and then you integrate it, and then you, you get, you support it, and you, and you keep evolving what you've done. Now, I'm going to go through some of these steps and give you more examples of visual AI as we go through this presentation. So historically, there, you know, a lot of these, if you build, build an AI model just to recognize masks and um, just to recognize faces and masks, then what you've got is a narrow vertical application. And these are somewhat brittle. So then if we ask you to recognize dogs, then you're going to have to go and train that. <laughs> you know, are there pets in the scene? Are there cars? Are there, and on and on. And typically this is what happens as you're growing a computer vision application is you want to do other things. And the problem with these one-to-one uh, -one narrow um, tasks is that they're often uh, brittle. Am I, someone's chatting here. Let me make sure. Uh, okay, that was not directed at me. Um, so the, the next generation of these, uh, of these applications are, are more broader solutions, platforms that allow uh, for more models and training. And Chooch is one of those. There's also Google Vision, there's Amazon Recognition, and there's others. And um, the, the goal of, of, of a platform is to minimize risk and allow you to deploy end-to-end, -end, from training to model development to deployment, testing, and growth. That's why you probably want to use a platform. You can do a homegrown solution uh, as part of your startup However, there's risks and brittleness 
you know, that come with that. Um, so training, right? You have your video or your images, you run them through your process and you end up with what's known as a perception library. And deep learning is the, the technical breakthrough that allowed uh, computer vision really to take off. One moment. It essentially creates neural networks that are deeper and more complex than um, years ago. And um, if you are using a platform, non-technical uh, people can, can do the training on the AI. Um, that's another advantage of using a platform, right? And what you, what you end up with are libraries storing your classes of objects. You, you end up with face masks and dogs and cars and all of these different objects that, that you've trained for. And um, there's really no limit to the size of your library, but as it grows, you need sort of a, a, a structure to how that library is searched so depending on what your what your focus is if it grows too large then you need uh, you know more technology on top of that stack to to figure out where to where to search um so and then once you've developed your your models uh, then you um have some kind of api that connects that to the rest of your system and when metadata comes in uh, sorry, when visual imagery comes in, then metadata is generated from that system. Um, you know, we have an iPhone app, and that is a really good example of how that works. So basically, you, you point the app at something, and it says wine bottle, or coffee cup, or, um, or candlestick holder. And it says that, you know, the, the app sends that metadata back to you because the image goes to the server, it looks for what that object is and then metadata is sent back. It's quite as simple as that. So if you're developing a system that requires um, some kind of computer vision or AI or text recognition or natural language processing, the natural language goes to the server, what comes back is metadata. This person said X. Um, what's interesting is you don't need the cloud anymore. NVIDIA has created these edge devices, and, and there are others as well, but we feel NVIDIA is the, server, the, the leader here. They've created edge devices that don't require the cloud. Essentially, we can send metadata locally to an NVIDIA uh, server, to, for lack of a better term, and the chip sends back uh, metadata extremely quickly. We're getting response times as little as 0.2 seconds. Um, so it's, it's near real time using an, uh, an NVIDIA local server. Um, this is how, here's a generalized map of what I've been talking about. And then I'm going to get into some use cases. How are we on time? I haven't really been paying too much attention, but generally I do the thing quickly. If, if I'm getting close, Donna, let me know, okay? Just, Absolutely. just interrupt me. So essentially, you, you, ideally, you have a system that works like this, that you have a dashboard where you're, you're training everything and then you're deploying to an edge server like a NVIDIA device or into the cloud where you, where you have something running your, your AI. And, in gen and typically that's a, an NVIDIA chip on AWS, for example, or on Microsoft Azure. Or whatever. And so your, your video streams go from the, you know, a, uh, an X-ray machine or a, um, or a surveillance camera, or oh, an iPhone app, or radar on a drone. And that goes to a server, and then what comes back is metadata of some kind. And I've written here like several different detection modes, right? You, you can detect actions, you know, did the batter hit the ball? For example, if you're developing a sports app, or what is that object? Or, you know, what is the scene? And then we can also do facial recognition. We can do text analysis. There's many different things you can do with, with visual AI. And it's, it's, if you're doing natural language processing, it'd be the same thing. You, you'd be listening to a voice, you'd be listening for keywords and, um, and sending back uh, uh, metadata based on, on what you've heard. Um, these are the kind of questions we answer, right? Um, what vehicle arrived? How many slides are on the cell? 
uh, so how many how many cells are on the slide? Are the workers wearing hard hats? This is similar to mask detection, hard hat detection. It's a compliance issue. And then tracking actions in uh, operating rooms. When was this patient anesthetized? Gauzes went into the surgical cavity. We can count things, right? Count cells, count gauzes, count vehicles, count hard hats. It's quite simple. Um, and these are the kind of results we get in these instances. We, we, rem we, we log um, vehicles that arrive remotely. We, uh, it, we reduce time and, and increase throughput. These are the benefits of, of why do this. And this is also why this is happening because this is, this is a, the massive productivity gain to be had from leveraging uh, something like computer vision because um, you get f more results faster and you can scale these things. Here's details about um, some, some use cases. So if you're, if, you're, um, if you're making sure that all your workers are wearing hard hats, your insurance rates can go down. It pays for itself. There's, there's these um, uh, tangible benefits to be had from these. Public health monitoring, right? Public spaces or businesses can can, can um, monitor for these kind of compliance issues and, and make sure that everybody's safe from COVID, right? Um, in, uh, in the healthcare space, we can identify cells. I mean, there, there's, there are, I, I should say, we, we know this from NVIDIA, there are literally hundreds of startups working on narrow applications in the healthcare space. And some of them have developed platforms which, um, uh, for that space for because the healthcare space is so um, ripe for um, um, disruption that's why a lot of folks are, are focused there um, and we've had some sec success with the surgical theater uh, uh, monitoring it's it's a fantastic application that can save lives there's thousands of uh, instruments actually it's a medical error instruments left inside people because in surgery and so this um, risk is being reduced and also steps are missed in surgeries and that risk is being reduced um, change detection in industrial applications or flaw detection is there a different heat source you know it, are there is there dust or specks on this um, on, on this object checking for that is critical because then you can reduce um, you know, rejects in manufacturing processes. Uh, content apps are, this is actually from our content app, from our, from our demo app, you know, identifying artwork. And we haven't focused on any of any particular um, use case in our, um, um, in our app because it's simply a demo. And AR is coming, right? Everybody is reading news about Apple and um, that's, um, that's, we're very interested in, in what they're doing. Um, uh, media enrichment. So if you have a new a photo news agency, this is actually from one of our customers, you can tag things much more quickly than you could before just by hand. Um, contextual advertising is ripe for disruption, right? Identifying objects and then serving ads into that space. These are just ideas to, you know, give you, uh, uh, a sense of the breadth of what you can do with something like visual AI. Um, dust detection, that's my dog, obviously. <laughs> Sorry about that. So um, dust detection in images for online retail or checking the quality and making sure images aren't blurry. The image on the bottom is a little out of focus and we can check for that. So this is a, a game changer for online retail because you can essentially quality control all the images that go onto your website immediately. Um, checking what's on store shelves, right? No one is doing this at scale, right? Um, so there's video cameras in every convenience store in the world. You could be checking every, um, every store shelf for products and reporting back what's missing. Um, Something we've worked on because we, we're passionate about it, like wildfire detection, satellite imagery parsing. Uh, this is another area where you know there's thousands of people looking at satellite images every day, um, looking for changes or or at, you know analysts. They're, they're looking for um, 
objects in, in satellite images, all of this can be done uh, by computer vision. So natural language processing, computer vision, text analysis, it all happens so much faster with visual AI and there's a clear payoff, right? So this is a, our example from, um, uh, that we crafted to make this clear. If you're doing, you know, aircraft inspection or car inspection at checkout with, um, with, uh, with um, car rentals, it might, might take a human five minutes to check your car or even one minute but they're gonna do it inaccurately, miss scratches, miss dents, miss you know, broken things on the exterior of the car. And machine learning can do it so much more, it can be trained to do this so much more quickly. If it takes a human you know, 80 seconds to do a visual task and you have 101 tasks to do and there's four people doing it, it takes you nine hours to do this task with human beings. But with, with computer vision, you essentially can do it immediately, right? It, it takes one second for each tasks, task. And you don't really need any people involved in this except someone to check the results. So it takes a couple of minutes to do what it would take for humans, you know, hours to do. And this can scale, right? You can clone this across servers and scale it up. And so any sort of visual, this is the, the reason we're doing this is there's a clear financial benefit to uh, working on these problems. So thank you. Um, I hope that the examples I gave and the, the process I outlined are, if you're considering doing, uh, you know, adding AI to any of your startup ideas, that this is helpful. Um, so thanks, any questions? Perfect, thank you so much, Jack. That was really informative. Um, we'll go ahead and we'll allow a couple minutes for questions to start pouring in. Uh, as a reminder for all of our viewers, our startups, uh, we have the Q&A section below where you can send over questions for Jeff and uh, he'll answer them for you. There's, a, there's something in chat. There is something in chat. Mm -hmm. All right, we can see that too. What issues have you run into uh, historical, historical data? Um, do you work with newly collected data only? Um, no, we can work with historical data. I mean, it, it's the same uh, problem. The, so historical data needs to be organized into, so let's say you want to work on something like historical baseball imagery. So you, you know, and you want to know what players are, have done what things in old baseball uh, video or imagery. So you would, train, uh, you can, you can, we could train Chooch to understand every uniform of every uh, um, uh, team and then assign the numbers to names and then go back through historical video of baseball and add metadata to all that video. And we could, for example, show you every uh, moment that a certain player hit the ball. So there's no problem using historical data at all. We don't need new data. We just need to organize the imagery so that we can train the system to then process the inbound video or, or imagery. I see another uh, chat. Currently I'm building a text message AI. Just curious if possible to have it train itself and would it be more diff difficult to set up? You know, historically there, there was a guy I interviewed 20 years ago when I was writing an article for Wired about AI. And his name is Jerry Tesoro. And he set up two, a, a neural network to, to, to play Go. Uh, no, no, sorry, to play backgammon. And what he did was he had the, the backgammon game play itself a million times, and it became one of the best backgammon players in the world. So you can um, self-train, but you need a, a system for that. Um, and I'm not trying, uh, sure what you're trying to do with text message AI, but that sounds like a great idea. You know, a, a chat bot that works by text is, is a fantastic uh, sort of right. idea. Let me look through these. How did you find your first customers? Uh, personal contacts. That's how we started out. Um, and uh, that it's, it's a, you know, business development in the beginning is the way to get 
that going. Could you talk a little bit about the brittleness, not using platform, please? Thank you. Yeah, so you're gonna build something from scratch and um, that it's gonna take a lot of time and you're gonna train a specific uh, uh, thing like detecting uh, retinal disease. So your AI, you're, you're gonna train for that and train for that. And then you're gonna have a system that does that. But then if you want to grow beyond that and train for other things, you're gonna be very deep in retinal disease detection. But then when we ask you to detect melanoma or to um, detect um, uh, something that's not a, a, a disease, it's gonna be hard or, or to detect whether there's dust on a piece of glass, it's gonna be hard for you to go beyond that. So the, there's a built-in brittleness when you're training for a specific use case and using a certain kind of data. Uh, so for example, like microscopic data of, of, of retinas. Um, what are the watch outs risk for using visual AI? Um, privacy is one that we are very concerned about. So we're really careful about, uh, we don't do any facial recognition the only thing we'll do is facial authentication. It's consent-based. So there's, there's risk with visual understanding in, in privacy. Um, there's also risk with um, uh, deployment, right? You know, these platforms are very complex and it takes uh, a certain amount of experience to, to get them right. And going down, for example, a, a narrow application, you can end up in, in a rabbit hole. Um, that's why the, this, this growth of platforms has, has come about to make these things easier. It's like, you know, before WordPress, you just had raw HTML, right? Or you had, you probably had other CMSs, of course. But as time went on, it got easier to publish these things. And that's what's happening with AI right now. It's getting easier because of platforms. How do you handle um, GDPR, CPA, so you focus on your business? Well, GDPR, we don't spam people. <laughs> um, and we're very careful about privacy issues. So that's, um, that's how we handle it. Um, and because uh, we hear this kind of thing all the time. We're, I'm looking in chat now. I, am, I would think that picking out dust has to do with how the GPU processes the images and will set it in. I mean, power systems have a much easier time picking up dust would be a, well, yeah, I mean, the, the, you need a GPU to do these things. You, you can't use x86 architecture anymore. And that's, um, that's why NVIDIA is growing so much in this, in this space. Absolutely. Okay, I think I've, any, anybody else? Okay. I think we should be good for now. And any other questions that we receive, we'll definitely send those over to you. Thank you Excellent. so much. Jeff. Yeah, no problem. Of course. Thanks for having and me. Of course, always. Thank you for being here. Yeah. For one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, mentor session a request, please let us know in the feedback form whether you'd like to meet with Jeff in the next uh, upcoming weeks. Happy to. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jeff. All right, so we'll just allow a couple minutes for the feedback form. All right, let's go ahead and go on to our next presenter today. The topic is machine learning, powering data insights. And uh, Mark Germishus with NGA will be presenting. Hi, Mark. Hi, good morning, everyone. Perfect, we can see you. Thanks. Uh, hi, good morning, everyone. And yeah, QTech, thanks once again for inviting me uh, to speak about powering of uh, data insights by using machine learning. It's a very, very big, important topic to me and one I'm very passionate about and I've been doing for many years. Um, so why do we look at machine learning to power insights? And uh, my, from my opinion, it's very simple. It's one of the smartest and easiest ways to gain data insight. It can enhance your current uh, product offering and it can give you an edge. When we talk about an edge, uh, what I'm saying is it can give you an edge of your competitors. It can give you an edge in saving time and money. It can show you 
opportunities, and it can also help you avoid risk, which you might not know. So how your data insights empowers you is that it gives you more time to think and act on things that identifies than using just your only knowledge you have or your declaration knowledge. It gives you insight that you can prevent things quicker and you can respond and act to things in a much quicker way. So when we look at uh, data uh, powered uh, to get business insights, we look at it three separate things. The first is the data. The data is the input, the driver. We have the machine learning. And the machine learning, we look at it as a glue, a glue between the data and the insights. The insight is the output, your goal. What do you want to achieve with your data? And that's what we, when we're speaking about data insights, is actually what do we want to achieve. And that machine learning, different, you have different algorithms, different methods, depending on what you want to achieve. And the data, what feeds this machine learning to get the data insights can either be unstructured data. When we talk about unstructured data, we're speaking about data in the cloud. It's not in a relational format. We, we're also speaking about structured data. Structured data is relational. It could be at your office. It could be easy to use data. It could be IoT data, data you gather from sensors. Or as Jeff mentioned earlier, it could be from visual AI where you get information from visuals. And putting that together, you will get your insight. So as a company, we simply say machine learning is a brainwave for data insights. It must be a mechanism or a tool or method to continuously update our knowledge um, on our data to provide us new insights on a daily basis. It's not a very successful method if it's a once off, but only provides us one data insight now and again. It's gotta be continuous, it's gotta be improving, and the main thing, it must always deduce new facts for us that we can action. So we need to see the wow from the data and how we can actually use that wow to address maybe risks or opportunities which lie ahead of us. Today, machine learning is changing the way we do business, the way we live. Um, here's a few examples of how machine learning has uh, taken data and given us new insights, new methods. We've got text-based uh, learning, we've got online recommendation systems, we've got fraud detection, credit scoring, we've got prediction systems which can say if something's going to succeed or it's going to fail, we've got social listening applications and models. So you can see today machine learning is very integrated into what we, we do. It's not uh, no longer a science where only a few people are using it or taking the application algorithms to enhance their product. It's something which we have to incorporate in our lives on a daily basis. We have examples of Google uh, ads, we've got Netflix, we've got assisted driving, cancer diagnosis, uh, we've spoke about facial detection, voice assistance. These are playing a big part of our lives. And if we're going to offer the market new technology, new tools or services, I believe firmly that it has to incorporate some form of machine learning to get data insights which give you the edge or an opportunity which you might not have if you were only reliant on your declaration knowledge, the knowledge that you only know. What you want to try to do with data learning and to, to gain insight is to actually see what hap is happening with your data within your database. What is actually causing certain things to take place? What is causing things not to take place? And if you get the right machine learning, your data insights be valuable because now you actually can understand how the different data elements and variables within the data you've gathered are actually interacting together with an outcome so you can go towards that and once you know what you want to achieve it's very easy then to see what type of machine learning you would like to use you can either have supervised machine learning unsupervised machine learning or reinforcement learning depending on what you're looking for as well as the data you have and also, do you know the results? If you do not know the results or outcomes you're looking for, you will choose a different machine learning method. If you know exactly what you're looking for, you would also do a different method. So depending on what your outcome is, your goal and your vision, you will select different methods of machine learning to get the specific data types and insights you're looking for. As I said earlier, it's important 
that when you choose a machine learning method or algorithm to get business and data insights, you must look at something which is scalable, which is continuous, and which can grow as the data elements become more available. Because the important thing is to get better data insights in business, you can continuously loop your machine learning. So once you get a result, you can use that result into another system and get it stronger and better and improve your results and your knowledge on a daily basis. So once you get one result or one data insight, it doesn't mean your system stops or it has to end there. You can use that information gathered as another variable, another source of information or field, which you can add into your system and then retrain it the whole time and improve and get smarter and smarter all the time. If we look at an example here, and today I want to show you a few examples uh, we as NGA have been involved with and what we've been able to achieve uh, using machine learning and get a data insights which it would be impossible and humanly impossible to achieve had we not used machine learning. So here's an example of Google. If we use a search and we want to look at educational industry force, uh, forecasting, you can see uh, we get 236 million matches. Uh, as a human, we can't analyze all this information. We can't read all of it. And if we did, we would get tired after page three, four, five. So with machine learning, depending on what you want to look for, uh, you can train the system to say, all I want to do is I want to look at all information available in the educational sector, which is speaking about a specific software type. I want to know what services they're offering, what their quality is, what their pricing is, who's doing it, when are they doing it, where they're doing it, and what are the nice things which are linking all 236,000 articles together, which I need to focus on as a product vendor, or if I'm offering a service to a client, what should I be informing my client of? And this is what machine learning is when you look at text analysis, is saying how you can train public available information, could be not only public, it could be normal data, on actually going into the article, reading the article, and coming back and saying to you, this is what you're looking for. These are the three or four key aspects or points you are in, uh, interested in without you having to read the entire article. Um, what we did recently, which is quite nice, is we did a case study with a client um, at a, quite a big bank. And we said to them, take two of your top analysts and we want to see what they are capable of doing human with no tools, no technology, no machine learning, uh, to go into Google, for instance, and look at public information. And within 10 minutes, they were able to read seven public sources of information and analyze them very briefly on a rough piece of paper. We used our technology using machine learning to see what data insights we could gather. And we analyzed over 492,000 sources, not articles, within 10 minutes. And we wrote the report on, on these articles uh, we identified within 10 minutes. So as you can see, if you're gonna compete or not use machine learning, if it's required with your technology, you can't, you can't compete with someone who's using it. It's not humanly possible to do the, the techniques, the methods and the speeds which are currently available with machine learning to enhance your product, your knowledge and your information on the data which is out there at the moment. What's also very nice about it, once you've got your data and you know what you're playing with, you can get a lot of different aspects. You might want to look at your industry or competitor insights. And the thing with data is that there's so much publicly available information. We do not have a shortage of data at the moment. What we do have a shortage is, is how we analyze this data and get the most true, accurate, best results to give us the best insights. We want to look at what trends there are. We want to hit, find out what's hidden in that data. What are the gems? What are the risks which we could not have seen had we done it by ourselves? And we want to understand the data. What is it saying? What are the trends? Where is the market moving towards? Uh, where is the market moving against? And what should we do as a company? And this type of technology, when you use machine learning and it brings you the insights, can be very uh, quickly available on a daily basis, within minutes, it could be near real time, depending on what you want, what infrastructure you have in place, and the data you're analyzing. Another example of machine learning um, today is um, sentiment analysis. Um, so you can train uh, machine learning to give you data insights and information just on sentiment. Um, in this example here, 
uh, what we do is we look at the sentiment not at a sentence level, but we actually look at the entire article. And once we get the article, we analyze it at an industry level. So we can see where the articles, which articles are influencing what industries the most, and what are the key elements which this machine learning is highlighting to us? What is the topics which is highlighting to us, which we need to focus on as a company to make sure that our customers, our clients, and even ourselves are aware of and need to focus more attention on instead of wasting time on less important, less risky, less relevant things, we focus on 10 or 20 key things which our system highlights to us, which we know will give us an advantage over everyone else. What you can also do with machine learning to get better uh, data insights and business insights is actually add models together. So you could bring different machine learning uh, uh, algorithms together. You can do classification models, you can do clustering, uh, depending what your goal is. Again, when I start at the beginning, the most important thing is saying, what data do I have? What data do I need to play with? And what is my final goal, uh, what I need to achieve? And once you start doing that, and that's why it's important to have a very versatile, scalable solution, um, that as you grow and you identify the different things you need to do, your solution can grow, that your data insights grow with you, your business, and your direction you want to go with in business. Um, the data can be used for many things. It can be used for timeline analysis. You might want to see um, how products are launched. Or for instance, in this example here, uh, it's related to uh, strawberry uh, grown in hydroponics. I mean, what are the key things people globally um, are looking at when they're looking at strawberries grown in hydroponics? Uh, and the things which are very key to them is the, the different products you can produce from them, the, the price, as well as uh, what, it, what is the finances? How can you get finances to grow strawberry? These were things clients asked us to look at, which is not a norm which we normally do, but having machine learning and pulling out the right data insights and having trained it correctly, anything is possible with the right data set. And here's another example um, which I love to use. This is an example which we did. And a bit of background to this example is uh, we went to a, a very big listed client and we went to the audit firm. And we said to the audit firm, it was one of the big four audit firms, uh, we said we can do a quality review of the customer you've just signed the financials off using data insights and they couldn't believe us. And what we did is we wrote a program to identify what people are complaining about on these various products this retailer produces. But what we did is we put limits in place. So we said we will only mention it if we pick up more than 100 different complaints per product type. And as you can see at the top, these were the problems we started picking up. It was a lot of problems had worms in it. They were not filled correctly. They were mislabeled. There was maggots. There was eggs. Some of the flavorings didn't dissolve. And this, the scariest thing was this is all publicly available information. Information you can gather, you can analyze and get data insights from. So that if you look at another level, you can now start understanding the processes, the quality control processes of the actual reseller, a reseller or retailer. And you can see that they weren't very good. They weren't in place. So besides all the reputational, um, what we did and showed the audit firm is that they've just signed off on financials and did quality control reviews. But in fact, there were problems in the storage depots, there was product in the ingredients, on the storage uh, mechanisms and so forth. And this was all gathered from not even visiting, visiting the client on site and doing an audit or a review it was purely from data available to the public which we were able to make, uh, obtain, analyze, and actually classify and say, this is the problems which you're having with your products. Another example for data insights could be to see why are share prices moving, what caused it or what triggered a certain movement, which could be interesting. So again, it can look at all publicly available information. It might have been a decision what the FDA made, uh, granting or rejecting a certain process an organization was doing, which could be a share price movement. Again, another mechanism which machine learning can give you the information about. Um, another uh, area which we delved in was smart agriculture. Uh, so we as an organization have uh, built and developed our own growing vertical tunnels. And we, we are not farmers, we've got no knowledge on it. But our example was saying, if we do not have knowledge, could we use machine learning 
with a bit of domain knowledge to actually grow and run a farm on a daily basis just using AI and minimal staff. And we were able to do it. Currently, we've got farms growing greens, lettuce, basil, thyme, automatically with automatic systems and dosing units, just gathering data, looking at data insights and automatically making changes and workflows to the tunnels on a daily basis using Mobi apps, IoT, raw data, weather forecasts, and all of that. Uh, we spoke earlier about text analysis. Uh, what happens if we pick up a disease, our dosing units and our tunnels automatically change the processes. And this is the data insights you can gather. And what I wanted to show today is data doesn't only have to be for financial organizations or banking or retail or medical. It can be any industry type. As long as you can identify the data, gather the data, and it's good quality data, you know how to use it. Machine learning can get data insights anywhere. Here's just another slide show. A uh, slide how we use, uh, uh, for instance, tomatoes. We look at the texture. We can identify what's wrong with it. And then the machines will automatically change our nutrients. So the biggest thing we're saying today is not if you're going to use machine learning to gather data insights in your business on a daily basis. It's what part is it going to play in your business or in your technology to give you the edge uh, uh, over your competitors and also take you on the next level uh, of your uh, journey if it's a startup or if you're a mature organization uh, to go on a new journey or path, which might be more profitable or viable for yourselves. So to summarize uh, what's very important when looking at machine learning to get data insights, when you build a system, make sure it's very seamless, it's versatile, it's consistent and it's scalable. It can grow as your data grows and as your needs or requirements change, it needs to be able to change as well. So don't make it too solid, too small, too robust, it needs to be able to change dynamically and be consistent as well for you to adapt. And uh, last minute, uh, don't always, don't forget your domain experts and your, your knowledge experts in your system. It's very important to understand the data, uh, what you've got and what you can pull from it. So machine learning alone will give you very powerful insights, but never forget that you also have to incorporate an element of knowledge when you're analyzing data to get the best results. So I hope this uh, gave you a bit more insight into machine learning and what data insights you can gather from the data you analyze using machine learning. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Mark. All right, so uh, as a reminder to all of our viewers, please send over your questions to the Q&A section below, and I will be reading those questions for Mark. Let's allow a couple minutes for that. All right, there we go. We have our first question. Can we build the system before having collected data? Uh, yes and no. Uh, we, we've done both in the past. Uh, a lot of times, depending on the type of machine learning and what you want to achieve, um, sometimes if you do reinforcement learning, you're actually gathering the data as the machine learning occurs. Um, if you... If you're building it uh, where you, you know there's data available or data which is available, you might not have it already, my recommendation is get the data first, generate the data, even if it's in a smaller scale, smaller volume, uh, but test it first. Don't, don't build the model before the data. Uh, we've burnt our fingers. Uh, we've had some machine learning projects work for over two years uh, where we, the quality of the data is not where it is today. And it had we had looked at data and spent more time on that data, uh, we would have done it in a much shorter time period and saved a lot of time and money. So it is very important uh, to look at the data. Absolutely. We will wait for a couple more, a couple more minutes for questions. Actually, we have one right here. How do you think machine learning can be used to develop conversational bots? Um, yeah, we, 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 we built a very, uh, it can be used very nicely. We built a machine learning uh, system for training uh, in one of the financial institutions where we're training people about anti-money laundering at the banks. Um, so with this lockdown, uh, they don't, their training department, people can ask questions and train the whole time. Um, so from a training point of view, it's happening now. We've got great success with it. And what's very nice about it is if you train your solution nicely, and it can actually replicate your best trainers and have the same amount of knowledge. 
what you've got then is you've got a very consistent, clever system giving the same information across the board. So it should that best trainer or domain expert person leave, the system still then gets cleverer the whole time. What, what's also nice about it is when you're building a chat box like that, have, have something in place um, that should you not have the answer in that, it can store it. Um, so you can use that as a Q&A to build the knowledge of the system as you go through. Don't just ignore it. Get a method where you can gather that information and build it into your system the whole time so it's continuously getting better with your chats. Great. Do you perform data uh, anonymization or not so much? Why? Uh, we do. We do do a lot. Um, uh, because our results, uh, if we had to just rely on um, the results as they came through, uh, our, our, end result, our actions we take would be totally incorrect. Um, so for instance, um, uh, depending also what systems you do. So for instance, if you're looking at a fraud system uh, and you know the quality of the data is reliable, and that's very important uh, when you look at that, if the quality of the data is reliable and consistent, you can use that as an outlier uh, to investigate for fraud or credit reviews or so forth. Um, but if your data quality changes a lot, it's not good. You need to make a mechanism where you need to make a medium or, an, uh, um, or take the outliers totally out because otherwise your results are going to be obscure. So if you've got one plus 100 and you get your average, your average is not going to be correct. So it's important to get the outliers out of the system if your data is not reliable. And how do you ensure that the data you're using is valid and reliable data, especially at scale? Well, um, there's, there's multiple, you've got to build, build a lot of checks and controls in place. Uh, completeness checks would be one. Um, so for instance, a lot of times, uh, if you look at a Twitter example, we were looking at one of the universities in America yesterday was 0.7% uh, of the tweets they were looking at only had location-based information. Uh, right, so they didn't want to use that um, to get information on where the people were located because there's such a minimal amount. So what we do is we look at completeness. How many of the actual rows or fields are completed? We look at the integrity. Is it invalid data? Is it valid data as well? Uh, so it's not just the volumes. It's not the, the, just the completeness. It's actually the quality of the data within it. So what we also do a lot of times is if we build an application, uh, we make sure that if we can, through the application provider drop down or a mechanism to ensure the quality of the data, we try to provide that because that will help us at a later stage to analyze it by having the correct data. Um, but yes, quality of data is a huge problem. A lot of times we've, got a, we've built amazing models, fantastic models, which we believe can predict amazing things going forward, just that the quality of the data lets us down and gives us the wrong results. The algorithms are built, we know how to build it, but the data was not uh, correct and let us down. Uh, do you currently have tools to convert data from various databases into your software to simplify the processing of that information? Uh, yes, yeah. So we've, we've, over the many years now, built quite a big uh, infrastructure um, application or software where we pull multiple data sources into one application. So we've had to deal with all different data types to bring it into the standard which we like to play with. So yes, we do have mechanism and techniques to pull different data sources into a standard type of data. Okay, sounds good. And uh, I did jump the gun on that. I think that we have a little bit more time for questions. Okay. So um, how do you handle data privacy when building models for your customers? Sure. Um, as Jeff said uh, earlier, I mean, data privacy is a, is a very big thing for us as well as a company to, to control and monitor. Uh, and when it comes to data, Besides the privacy, we, you've got to look at all the regulations. Um, so there's so many uh, fair usage, uh, right to be forgotten clauses. Um, what you always got to do is you've got to uh, refer to the source of the information you gather. Uh, we don't do scraping, for instance, and things like that. So yes, data privacy is very important. Uh, a lot of times people are putting misinformation about other people so they can distort uh, the real message. Uh, it's sad, but that it is happening in today's economy and in the world is that there are companies out there uh, making other companies have bad names. So you have to start looking and analyzing the data and, and start putting your own internal, call it uh, watch list, to say rich sources are not very good, uh, rich are good sources and rich are actually uh, manipulated sources. Rich, rich sources are being paid for to actually put another client down, to put another brand down. 
Um, so that's what we have to look at at privacy. But again, um, we, we, we built our solution. We looked at all the, the, the Fair Usage Acts and all of that and said, how much information can we display? How much information can we use? Uh, what information are we allowed to use? And actually, and are we allowed to actually access that information? Are you legally allowed to access it? Because the biggest problem with IT, uh, not a problem, <laughs> uh, people, IT people love challenges. And uh, what happens is a lot of people can do a lot of things. You get your hackers in the world, you get people who think they're very clever because they can access a site and gather the information. But if you're not allowed to use that information and there's copyrights, you have to adhere to it. So it's not always the means of, can I do it? Yes, technically you can do a lot of things. But are you allowed to do is another question. And that's, that's what you have to look at the whole time. Great. Thank you so much for clarifying that, Mark. I think we should be good for uh, today. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for allowing me to speak. I appreciate you being here. Thanks. And uh, as you can see, on uh, we have our banner up for our upcoming workshops. Please take note of our workshops. Um, we have them quite often, and they are um, very valuable to startups. Um, if we do have a feedback form for you, please fill that out. Your uh, feedback is valuable to us. And uh, it's a way for you to have one-on-one -on -one mentor sessions with the mentors today. Now we'll go ahead and we will move on to our next presenter today. Introducing uh, the next speaker, uh, the mentor, is uh, Saurabh Bharadwaj. Um, he is uh, an enterprise architect at Kiwi Tech, um, and he will be presenting today uh, blockchain uh, as one of the topics of discussion. Uh, over to Saurabh. Thank you, Mohsen. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Saurabh Bharadwaj. I work as an enterprise architect at Kiwi Tech. And uh, one of the best things about my job is that I get to talk to you, uh, talk to the entrepreneurs like yourself, and uh, I get to work on the great ideas. And in the process, I have realized that, uh, you know, blockchain is probably one of the most uh, misunderstood technologies. Uh, and so my goal today is to help you understand what is blockchain, uh, why is it so popular, and most importantly, uh, help you understand if it is the right tool for you or not. Uh, so first, let me just start by uh, sharing my screen real quick. Oh, oh it's already shared. Okay. Uh, so uh, let's start with uh, debunking some of the myths around blockchain. Uh, a lot of people uh, think that blockchain is Bitcoin, uh, but Bitcoin is what we call a cryptocurrency. And it is only one of the many use cases of blockchain. Uh, and uh, also blockchain is not just for financial services industry. Uh, in fact, later we'll have a look at some of the other applications of blockchain. And of course, uh, there are more than one blockchains. Uh, for example, some of the popular ones you may have heard about are Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Stellar. Uh, another misconception is that cryptocurrencies are uh, great for criminals, but they are really not. Uh, because uh, you know all the transactions on a blockchain are basically you know publicly available and they are traceable, so you know it, it's not that great as the common perception uh, perception seems to be. So uh, I mean now I'm sure that you uh, know that blockchain has been around for many years, uh, but how did it all start and how did we get where we are today? Uh, it started back in 2009 when Satoshi Nakamoto released a paper on a cryptocurrency called blockchain, or sorry, uh, the Bitcoin. And it talked about how this new currency is decentralized and uh, utilizes cryptography and how it can be trusted. Uh, and uh, you know, basically uh, in, in your conventional fiat currencies, uh, there is one central authority which could actually print uh, you know, currencies if they see fit. So that could be a currency potentially. Uh, but then uh, blockchain uh, or the Bitcoin wanted to change all of that. And we will look into why is that in a bit. Uh, but first, let's start uh, by having a look at the timelines. Uh, as you can see, the idea of uh, blockchain has been around since 1990s, and, uh, but it was only in 2009 when Satoshi Nakamoto published his paper. Uh, since then, it has evolved and found many uses, uh, ranging from domains requiring reliable and cheap transactions, contracts, to even distributed apps, uh, where data is not stored on any central server, but it's distributed. 
And uh, around 2014, uh, one of the notable improvements was introduction of smart contracts, uh, which is basically a piece of code uh, which is executed based on certain conditions being fulfilled. Uh, typically, it's just like any other function uh, you would have, uh, but it's a convenient feature or quality of life feature in a lot of blockchain software these days. Uh, and due to that, uh, it also means that assets or you know, anything else uh, can be traded or transfer, transferred without the need for manual intervention, uh, thus automating the whole thing. And uh, this also means that transactions are really cheap now and they are less prone to errors. And uh, for certain businesses, that could certainly provide the competitive edge. Uh, so that's uh, you know, one of the best uh, cases. And uh, next, we will be looking at uh, you know what blockchain is and how it really works. So uh, blockchain in its simplest form is a file, uh, which is basically stored on a hard drive in which we can pretty much store any kind of information. And uh, this file is basically a chain of blocks, uh, which are made up of digital pieces of information. Uh, a cryptographic hash is generated for every block. And this hash is like a fingerprint, uh, which is unique for a given piece of data. And so every block's hash is included as a value in the next block's data, which means if anything is changed in any of the blocks, all the subsequent hashes you know, which are there in the next blocks will have to be recalculated. Otherwise, the blockchain will not be valid anymore. And, and this is where uh, blockchain gets its immutability from, uh, that if we change something, it basically means the whole thing has changed and it's not the original blockchain anymore. Uh, now, this blockchain, again, is, uh, this is stored on multiple computers on network. And these computers we refer to as peers. Uh, and, you may be wondering that, you know, that's all good, but how does a blockchain get added to, or how does a block get added to a chain if this chain resides on multiple peers? Uh, well, uh, let's have a look at that next. So assuming every uh, block represents a transaction, uh, how do we make sure every peer on a network agrees to it that, you know, they want to add that block on chain? Uh, well, uh, whenever a transaction is requested to be added on a blockchain, it gets added to what we call transaction pool. And uh, depending on blockchain's software implementation, uh, you know, a node or a miner uh, then uh, tries to create a hash which fulfills certain conditions. And these conditions are dictated by, again, the framework which uh, you know, we are using for the blockchain. And uh, once these conditions are met, a uh, hash is then broadcasted over to the network and all the peers receive it and uh, it is for their approval and uh, you know the mechanism with which they uh, grant this approval is called consensus so uh, basically a majority of uh, peers on the network will have to agree that the transaction should be added to the blockchain uh, otherwise it will will not be treated as a legit transaction and uh, so when the majority of the network approves this transaction it is uh, added and then we call the transaction is complete uh, but one thing to note here is that different blockchain software may implement consensus differently. Uh, you know, there are different methods like proof of work, proof of stake, uh, and some of the frameworks like IPM, Hyperledger, they have their own, uh, you know, consensus protocols, which we could choose. Uh, and they also include some things like voting. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, whatever business use case we are working towards, we, uh, you know, and, and whether it's public or a private blockchain, uh, we that is one of the deciding factors in choosing the uh, you know, appropriate uh, frameworks, and uh, also recently we have seen uh, you know a lot of use cases for permission blockchain networks, uh, which are uh, you know basically private blockchain networks. Uh, so maybe ne next let's uh, look at some of the differences between the public and the private blockchain networks. Uh, one of the biggest reasons for uh, trust in cryptocurrencies is due to the fact that there is no central entity or server which controls it. Uh, that means if one were to take control of this blockchain network, he would have to manipulate blockchain stored on more than 50% of the peers on network. And for a public network with say a million nodes, uh, that would mean you have to hack more than 500,000 computers, which would be rather inconvenient. Uh, so uh, you know that's where uh, we, we have this effect called safety in numbers that uh, you know, it's not very easy to do that. Uh, 
Uh, but if you're running a private blockchain, on the other hand, uh, you know, uh, a network which has fewer peers, it would relatively be easier to take control of. Uh, but having said that, uh, it could still be useful in certain scenarios where you only need certain parties to have access to it, uh, but still want to leverage the benefits of blockchain. Uh, in the next slide, let's look at some of the use cases of both type of blockchain networks. And it's up to you to determine what's is which is which one is suited for public versus private uh, networks. So here you can see some of the popular uh, use cases of blockchain. Uh, for example, it can reduce transaction costs for payment processing and uh, money transfers. So there could be uh, you know negligible fee like we discussed earlier, and they would be uh, much quicker than uh, the conventional methods. Uh, another would be uh, the supply chain management. Uh, where there are several parties and vendors involved and uh, you know one default or an error could prove to be very costly uh, and it could hamper the business so the reliability of blockchain here especially uh, when combined with maybe things like iot devices could prove to be quite useful here uh, and uh, then it also finds uses in real estate uh, title transfers where you could al almost instantaneously do title transfers uh, and uh, you know the whole process could be automated. Uh, also, the immutability will definitely be useful in you know data backup and sharing. Uh, there are some companies which are you know doing uh, things in, in that area, uh, where and it's especially useful because uh, you know some of historical records are uh, you know automatically preserved if they were to be added to the blockchain. And uh, another interesting use case, uh, you know, could be for medical research. Uh, you know, and uh, like Mark and Jeff earlier mentioned about AI and their power we have today these days. Uh, you know, if we could maybe somehow have anonymized medical records stored on, uh, you know, single blockchain in the world for say uh, cancer patients, uh, you know, the amount of data available for AI to process may, I mean, it could potentially result in a breakthrough uh, in the research. So I think. That, that is something uh, I hope someone uh, really uh, you know initiates that. Uh, and uh, the other thing could include uh, you know for example electronic voting. Uh, and uh, I mean in India at least uh, you know we have seen uh, recently uh, there there has been a lot of uh, you know uh, issues with uh, or, or a lot of concerns are being raised whether the EVM or electronic voting machines are reliable or not. Uh, but if uh, we were to put everything on blockchain, all the voting would were to be done through blockchain, uh, you know, it would be transparent in the sense that any citizen could look at them and there would be uh, no need for any counting. And, you know, government would definitely, or, or this process would definitely earn the trust of, you know, all the citizens. And, and like this, the list goes on and on. Uh, I'm sure there are many more industry disrupting ideas out there and uh, which are waiting to be implemented. Uh, so, yeah. There's that. Uh, next, we'll look at some of the benefits of using blockchain. Uh, and they are, uh, they include res reduced costs of transactions, as it's, uh, like I mentioned before, it's automated and quick, and features like smart contracts have uh, made it even better. Uh, reduction is systemic risks, uh, and that's primarily due to the decentralized nature of it. Uh, next would be the immutable transactions and improved security, which is achieved by cryptography and uh, this is the same uh, concept or principles behind you know all the encryption we are using and it all really boils down to you know finding the product of two prime numbers if if we are to oversimplify it and uh, then uh, the blockchain also minimizes fraud uh, because of cryptography and it also eliminates the need for human intervention and uh, since the public is in, uh, in or, or the sorry, the information is publicly available, uh, it leads to effective monitoring and auditing by participants or potential regulators. Uh, uh, but like any other technology, uh, it is not without its challenges. Uh, even though we've come a long way, uh, blockchain frameworks are still kind of evolving and it can be challenging to customize them beyond a certain point. Uh, but the good news is that uh, there is uh, progress uh, is being made uh, every day and they are getting better and better. Uh, next, it is still not used by masses, primarily due to the legal or regulatory issues and probably uh, you know, due to lack of understanding and myths around it, for example. Uh, 
in India, trading cryptocurrencies was you know illegal until recently uh, when Supreme Court issued an order to uplift the ban. Uh, and uh, and then we do have uh, you, you know several other popular blockchain uh, networks now, uh, but the main problem is that none of them are really compatible. For some businesses, it's a good thing because now they can you know solve a problem of you know interoperability by creating exchanges and you know like like a market for exchanges these tokens or you know uh, even fiat currencies uh, but but this is one of the challenges it's not seamless and we have to find ways to integrate different networks uh, you know uh, in in a way that uh, i mean internet is interconnected blockchain are not and if they are i could only imagine you know what it would mean uh, you know for the evolution of this technology and uh, lastly, there have been uh, you know incidents when blockchain networks were compromised uh, and people have lost money. And so even though the technology is inherently secure, it is still prone to failure due to human errors uh, in terms of security holes or bugs in the blockchain implementation itself. So the software uh, you're running, if it has bugs, it could probably cause some issues. Uh, with all the benefits uh, and you know the challenges, uh, there are still some use cases uh, you know you may not want to use blockchain for. So, for example, if your business model does not need or benefit from decentralization, uh, you know maybe you have uh, just a simple web store. In that case, uh, you probably will not really benefit from storing your information, your order information, on a decentralized blockchain. Or if you have any data which you want to have full control over, and if you respect your use, users' privacy, uh, then please don't store their personal data on a public blockchain. Uh, lastly, there have been some use cases where you may only need, uh, you know, like an immutable ledger, and in such cases, uh, blockchain may be an overkill, and you may want to look into some, you know, immutable database products like Amazon's QLDB. And with that, uh, it concludes my presentation for today. I hope it was useful. And I'd like to thank everyone for listening to me today. And I will now take any questions you may have. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Saurabh, for that wonderful presentation on blockchain. And uh, my apologies, had some technical difficulties. Sure, no problem. Of course. Our first question, you made a reference to the various blockchain platforms available. Is there a single protocol or distributed ledger platform that Kiwi Tech recommends or is most familiar or experienced with? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we have, uh, we are working on different products and uh, it, I mean, we, in, in the process, we do evaluate different, uh, you know, blockchain softwares. And we realize that every framework is use, uh, is, is good for a, you know, a given use case. There is no one, uh, you know, size fits all framework out there right now uh, and so unfortunately we have to kind of you know learn from all the frameworks and we have to kind of weigh the pros and cons and decide on a given project you know which one is most useful oh there we go i was muted beyond the very popular app fantastic swap is there any great use of blockchain uh, within sports fan engagement not using crypto uh, I'm not sure about the not using crypto part. Uh, I would say for sports fan, it, it would be, I mean, one thing which really comes to my mind, first of all, is that, you know, if you were to purchase tickets for a football match, you know, blockchain or some, some network like blockchain would be a great way to make that purchases. Even if we have middlemen, uh, you know, selling tickets, uh, they could be running their own nodes. And, uh, you know, th that is one way. The other could be that you know if we have these all uh, you know uh, let's the, the leagues leagues uh, sports leagues you know if they were to trade players among different teams they could probably use blockchain uh, and uh, I mean there, there could be other use cases uh, but I'm not sure about the not crypto part uh, because blockchain is basically it's kind of uh, built upon uh, crypto. Great, thank you. Blockchain is also very energy consuming, using large fields of computers producing heat. Um, how has this evolved at all? Is there, are there ways to use the technology without this problem? 
again very good question uh, and i agree uh, it's you know the initial consensus protocol which were proof of stake and proof of work they so for so for example if we look at bitcoin they have a condition that you know every hash so should start with these number of zeros and in order to do that you know you have to constantly calculate uh, you know prime numbers with a brute force approach and you have to the first one who uh, you know computes that hash uh, is awarded uh, you know some credits and and this process because we are running so many gpus it takes a lot of power but there are different consensus protocols and you know uh, like i mentioned in, in my presentation the frameworks like ip and ledger uh, they are uh, you know implementing some uh, protocols where we do not uh, need such consensus protocols and uh, they have their own custom ways and you know they could be good in some use cases and definitely there are now uh, you know uh, examples we are seeing where memory or energy consumption is not uh, required or it's not or the difficulty could be lower to add uh, the next block to the chain how does blockchain's handling existing vulnerabilities um there are several ways to compromise the integrity of the distributed general ledger systems right so uh, we can discuss uh, this more off uh, offline uh, but i would want to say that uh you know one human beings is the weakest link in uh, weakest link in any technology right uh, i mean there is uh, no uh, fix for that i guess uh, and if you talk about handling uh, vulnerabilities uh, you know if it's an open source system i'm sure as we move on with time there will be you know independent security auditors who will be evaluating these softwares who will be working uh, and reporting these bugs but it's like any other pro uh, software project which will or open source project even which will mature over the years uh, but right now uh, i mean the best we could do is we could uh, if we are using any open source system we could uh, you know pen test it we could probably go through the source code for the important things and you know just do it like the uh, you know like any independent security auditor would uh, go through that uh and and i i would definitely want to discuss uh, you know uh, how blockchain will uh, mean or what will it mean when we have quantum computing uh because definitely it will have implications on of, on the cryptography and it may be you know then possible uh, that you know blockchain is not uh, relevant anymore but i think we we haven't uh, i mean it's something to look out for but we haven't really reached there yet in the sense that you know we should be thinking about it right now but it's definitely a good topic to discuss uh, and uh, how do we currently detect and implement safeguards uh, from a variety of threat actors uh, we do have our internal uh, you know guidelines for security not just for blockchain projects but for all the projects we follow owas top 10 uh, you know security uh, uh, guidelines and and we do in some cases we do the pen testing in some cases third parties uh, you know they are hired and they are consulted in, in case we need hipaa compliance or anything like that uh, but yeah we we do have a team of uh, i mean and also we have uh, it built into static code analysis uh, in one of the tools we use uh, where it it can actually uh, you know automatically give us some uh, you know areas where there may be potential security issues so we use that approach as well I believe that um the um Howard did did want to clarify he's thinking more about imposters on the system. Uh I would say uh, we can probably uh, discuss that more in the context I'm not sure uh, what would be uh, the what kind of imposters we are talking about. So maybe this is something we can discuss offline for sure. Fantastic. That sounds good. Can you elaborate more in the use of blockchain for healthcare records advantages and uh, the security risks? So one of the things uh, you know in healthcare obviously when I uh, was referring to that point I uh, mentioned that it should be anonymized so that we don't store any public uh, or sorry private information on blockchain because obviously due to HIPAA compliance for one right uh, but you know if we were if uh, for example even for covid 19 if you know there was a network of uh, you know blockchains which was uh, having all the records of what for the symptoms at what time what uh, you know to, uh, what uh, i guess treatment was administered and uh, you know how patient responded to it and you know we have this information across all over the world and, and this was publicly available i'm sure a lot of you know companies and a lot of motivated individuals they would definitely want to you know look at that information they would want to see patterns they would want to 
you know, uh, see if, you know, or, or there would be a race to, you know, identify if we can, uh, you know, find any patterns and we can, based on that, we could get some insight and, you know, take some action based on that. I mean, I mean, that is the one thing which comes to my mind, but if uh, we have like for uh, HL7 or, you know, other systems uh, for intercommunication between different hospitals, we could probably have a private blockchain uh, where we could, uh, you know, even store the private patient information, but it has to be really restricted. Uh, you know, we, we have to have all the HIPAA checks in place uh, to ensure that, you know, that information is not visible to any eyes we don't want to. Uh, but I think uh, if that is achieved somehow, I think it will be something which all the hospitals across the world would use. And it would be like the scientific community, right? Uh, where all the research papers are shared with each other. So, I mean, I, I, I'm not in that field, but I'm sure, uh, you know, people who are more ex experts in that would definitely find more use cases in that. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Saurabh. So we have some uh, other questions that we'll, we'll be sure that uh, we can get answered after the event. Thank you. Thank you for presenting today. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, everyone. All right, great. So I'll go ahead and um, I'll present our next topic, AR, VR. And um, we have Hans Koch with my XR. Excellent, excellent. Well, good morning. Thank, thank you, Donald, appreciate that. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, I'm Hans Koch, uh, CEO and chairman of Mixer or my XR. Um, and today we're gonna talk about augmented reality, virtual reality, or any reality, because everybody, unlike these other technologies or whatever, everybody knows relatively what augmented reality is. Everybody knows what virtual reality is. But what is next and how is it going to all play out? That's sort of the whole thing. So why am I here? Um, my company was the first, we did the first long-term pro sports deal. Um, heavily publicized, the first AR syndication platform. We're fantastically now a Kiwi Tech partner and client, um, which we're very proud of. We have three products coming out this year, and we have failed so many times. Um, we won't go through those, but let's we just get started, whatever. I want to show you one video to sort of give you one idea in terms of what we do because this is, this is something that we've come out with, which is portals. Enjoy this for a second. So there you see one of our AR products, but it's a mix of AR and VR, as, as many of you might recognize, it's 360 video and stitched together. But when we come up with a new product and when we look at the partners and this technology moving forward, we always go, what's, what is the technology's purpose? Who is it serving? Um, How is it making somebody's life better? Um, and what is the ROI? So an ROI, we look at both the financial, but also the emotional ROI of everything. And this is not just in the work that we do, but the, the entire industry as a whole. Technology should have an emotional value. And no, there is no greater sort of purpose for augmented reality and virtual reality is to create an emotional uh, or other sort of ROI that may not necessarily show up in dollar signs, but it is, needs to show up in the connection with the technology. It's a big business because it's, you know, some people have said 570 billion, some people have said over a trillion, but it's growing so quickly and COVID-19 has done a lot to expand the uses and the, the need for things in both augmented reality and virtual reality. But let's start doing this in a different way. I want, want to sort of put it, my background, one of the, my careers has been in film. 
So I want to sort of put this into a different context and walk through the industry and sort of where we can make some changes, where we can do some things better. And when we look at types of AR today, if we put them in Hollywood terms, we have the feature films from Niantic, Pokemon Go, and, and Harry Potter, and those big budget, long investment sort of projects. Then you have the Google Playground groups who are doing film shorts and creating things that are like super special, but they're only get a couple minutes of engagement. And then you have the documentaries, which what I call are the, the documentaries, which are the interactions that are educational, that are interesting, that, you know, in this case, puts a giraffe in the middle of a museum. But those are the things that are sort of the interesting types of or basic categories of AR in Hollywood terms today. In VR, you have cult classics, you have the Karate Kid, which is the category which I call training, and then the documentary, which is basically the same thing, but travel and education and things like that. So those are all interesting. And then when you go to the documentary, you're told to relax. So you can go to this perfect, beautiful place and you're then experiencing this in 360. You don't, if you're in virtual reality, you don't wanna walk around the room. If you're in augmented reality, you're not gonna get this full experience. So now it's where you start to see this mix between AR, VR, which is now uh, more often going to be called XR as we see, start to see those pieces come together. But what is it, the most important thing as a developer of these technologies, what do you need to think about? And there's really only one, one thing to think about, and that's the end user. This is probably the most important slide of any sort of software development, especially when it comes to AR and VR. Understanding the user and how they're going to use it. Are they going to move with it? Are they going to be uh, sharing it with their friends? How is it going to impact their life? Give you a good example of how product development and industrial design, and we have to think about things in augmented reality and virtual reality with sort of an industrial design lens. One great example is what Apple did to the MP3 player in 2001. They created an basically a design around a product that inspired people to enjoy music, created an energy around it and a technology that already existed, but it was the way that they presented it that was the most powerful thing. So when we think about software design we, and augmented reality and virtual reality, it really becomes looking at the real world, looking up, looking over, looking around, smelling, feeling the different things that are going to impact the experiences that we create. And that's where you're gonna see the best ones. Now, one of the things that's been heavily talked about is augmented reality glasses. Sort of a blend of virtual reality, et cetera. This is what prototypes look like. Now you can imagine the user is probably trying to figure out how they're gonna get down the aisle way with all the different options that they have in their field of view. That's, this is one sort of scenario in terms of what AR glasses could do. One of the earliest prototypes was back in 1993. Michael Douglas created, oh wait, this is from a movie. So this is not actually a augmented reality glass. But what's interesting is when we look at the investment and ROI, this movie made more money in four months and made 70 million versus 13 million by Magic Leap in six months and a much different budget. So ROI is important when we look at how we create things. Then you take a look at some of the new forms of XR glasses. How are they gonna be used? Are they gonna be used for gaming? Are they gonna be used for work? Are they gonna be used for any number of applications but this is obviously not a device that you'd want to go jogging in. But there are other things that are more stationary that you may want to use with it. So it's important to understand the hardware, software, and user experience as it is complete. Here's something that we're working on with some of our partners like Ericsson. And it's all about 5G. 5G is going to allow us to create device 
to device activities, sharing portals, experiencing things in real time that are really going to be exciting change for the industry. And this is all, oh, sorry. We're now currently working on 6G. So we'll get back to you as, as that starts to happen. Things are happening very fast as far as the technology and the ability to change uh, between these different networks and what we can do. So it is a fast paced process. So let's look at the use cases. Anything falls under the category of applicable to AR and VR if it's done right. When you think about transportation, when you think about education, gamification, um, rehabilitation, surgical uh, processes, all of these industries have places for it, but it goes back to the user. How are you going to effectively communicate the technology just like you would any other software or app? The opportunities are endless, as are the solutions. The impact is if we are able to make AR and virtual reality a ubiquitous vision with all of these other technologies, even that you've heard today, we have the power to really impact positively our community, our businesses, our system, and especially in this COVID-19 environment, this is a super important time to do the best that we can in terms of creating the best and most impactful AR and VR software. The bar is getting raised every day. More people are attacking this industry and more technology and more brain power is getting put into this, but the opportunities are coming even faster. So I want to say thank you. Appreciate everybody's time. Enjoy the rest of the week and look forward to hearing any questions. All right. Fantastic. Thank you, Hans. Just going to wait for the questions to start pouring in, but you can go ahead and stop sharing the screen so we can see your video. As a reminder to our viewers, the Q&A section uh, on the bottom of the page is how you send over questions and I'll be reading them out loud. All right. How large of an industry is the AR VR for gaming? Well, gaming isn't a market that we focus on uh, specifically. So I'm probably not the expert to talk about AR VR for gaming. Um, VR is definitely a larger, uh, they've done a much better job in terms of attacking the gaming industry, both on the hardware and the software side. Augmented reality is, uh, heavily focused on the larger brands for for gaming or larger experience those blockbuster uh titles like from niantic um the rest of the gaming industry has not adopted ar as much yet but we'll start to see that so i'm not the best person to answer on gaming but some of my team would be so i can get back and give you more information on that great uh, specifically for a uh, federal space, do you see uh, use cases that can apply? Absolutely. Uh, in terms of the, in the, in the federal space, um, there are things that will improve operations. Uh, we're seeing uh, use cases in military and other operations. Um, uh, even State Department and, and, and the ability to visit and interact with other uh, state countries and things like that without having to travel and to be able to be present and to share emotional things and to show other the um, we actually see that as being a very big uh, market and lots of different ways to use the technology in both augmented reality and virtual reality to create create powerful really as a communication mechanism um, but also as a way to uh, experience something that's going on in, in another part of the country or the world. Sure. What are some valid use cases for enterprises to improve customers' engagement through XR? Oh, it's it's incredible. The you know you see the stories that, or the see the, the the videos of wine bottles coming to life because uh, the art on the wine bottle. Uh, jumps out at you if you hold it over. But I think what's interesting is when you start to bring 
sort of the social nature of it, uh, social nature of products, and you bring uh, products to people's homes in augmented reality in terms of where they can go literally shopping and experience things uh, without having to leave the house. So especially in, take this COVID example, um, being able to shop and do things virtually uh, and through augmented reality is really powerful in terms of just being able to like look around your room in, a, in an augmented or virtual reality and pick the things that you want and not having to do it just from a list that you might pull down on an app. Cool stuff. Could you talk about the uh, effectiveness of VR in physical therapy and uh, neurological rehabilitation? Ah, excellent. Um, we focus primarily on AR, uh, and we've been working with um, our various medical investors and partners to look at rehabilitation for uh, post-operative uh, situation. Part of that depends on the quality of the hand and foot tracking, things like that. So rehabilitation of those sort of things, um, we've got a really good handle of and being able to scale that. Um, some of the other things, we're looking at how to make that more effective. With augmented reality, you can actually do, we found you can do more uh, if we do it through a phone and other, because you're actually able to see the real world and make those comparisons. In VR, um, it's a slightly different. We haven't found a good use case in, in VR specifically, but we're gonna see those two, um, two technologies blend together. All right, and the last question here. On your website, there is a mention about using AR VR for citizen services with the state of California. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Uh, yes, we are working with, we have a non-AR technology that we're using for COVID communication um, that we'll be rolling out with the state of California here in the next few weeks. So it's not officially announced, but we are a partnership that has been working for several bit and we're, we loosely talk about it. I can tell. <laughs> no, that's great. Thank you so much. I, I definitely, um, I appreciate that. I appreciate you being here today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. And if you guys have any additional questions, we'll definitely get those answered after. Um, I want to go ahead and uh, before we hand it off to Mosin for closing remarks, thank you to all viewers and thank, thank you to our mentors for being here today. Um, let's go ahead and hand it back off to Mosin. So uh, first of all, uh, thank you to uh, Jeff, Mark, Saurabh, and Hans. Uh, fantastic presentations, great learning experiences. Uh, you know, I, I got a lot out of it, you know, myself, you know, uh, every time, uh, you know, we discuss these topics, there's, there's a lot of myths out there. It seems like a big mystery land uh, to navigate, but uh, you, you guys definitely, you know, brought home a lot of these concepts much more closer to understanding and obviously, I'm pretty certain that the startup entrepreneurs who are logged in today uh, have some wonderful learning experiences to take from here. And, uh, I, and we sincerely believe that the learning does not just limit to uh, attending the session. Uh, we'll be happy to schedule consulting sessions uh, with these mentors. Uh, you know, the feedback forms that are uh, that was uh, shared throughout the presentations or that will also be emailed after the event. Uh, feel free to um, Specify the mentors that you would like to have one-on-one -on -one consulting sessions for your businesses. Uh, again, um, at Kiwi Tech, we make it a, a continuous process to be able to bring in these workshops uh, on a monthly basis, uh, or at least fortnightly, as we would like to do it. Uh, the next one is going to be very interesting, uh, covering topics for startups who are raising Series A and beyond. Uh, we classify them as anybody who is raising uh, five million to twenty-five million dollars in their next round. So the topics of discussion and the mentors that uh, we'll be bringing uh, to uh, the guests would be covering those topics. Uh, it's gonna be a fantastic lineup uh, that includes some top-notch VCs and some top-notch strategy mentors who've uh, helped blaze uh, startups, you know, uh, significant check sizes in the past. Uh, with everything around health and ed tech being, uh, you know, uh, being on a pretty upswing, uh, we're gonna have uh, two workshops focused on health and wellness uh, on 1st and July 1st, and then 
uh, on around EdTech on 14th of July. So again, uh, if there are any suggestions to make our workshops better, if there are any suggestions that, uh, that you would have in terms of topics that you would like to see us cover during these workshops, feel free to write to us uh, at events at kiwitech.com. And again, on behalf of the entire Kiwi Tech team, on behalf of our partners today that presented, uh, thank you everyone for taking the time to join us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you very soon at one of our upcoming events. Take care, everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy. Bye-bye.